Good morning. How is, how is the Living Way family this morning? Good. good. Is this good? good? Yeah. I'm going to ask Ed if he'll go ahead and take his spot. Um, we're going to do something a little different this morning. I, I, I love worship, if you can't tell. And uh, when I was a child and I was taking piano and then in my teen years, my piano became my safe place. Um, it was where I went to pound out my frustrations or to, to take care of a moody thing. And God would always meet me there. I don't know where your safe place is, but you need one. If you don't have a trysting place where you meet with God, you need one. Um, this morning, we're going we're gonna to take a race through history. So I want you to hang on. Keep your Bible close. Okay, but you won't need it most of the time because I printed out the scriptures for you. Um, but we're going to go back and start with creation. And we're going to talk about a theological term that has poisoned man's thought since Sinai. Okay? It's called deism. That's the theological term. It's not in the Bible. And if you are a Pentecostal person, if you are a born-again person who is a disciple of Jesus Christ and you have a relationship with him, then you cannot be a person who dips a little snuff now and then. And I'm not talking regular snuff. I'm talking deism. That's like dipping a little snuff because you're, you have to be a theist. So there's a difference between theism and deism. And uh, at the risk of becoming professorial this morning, I'm going to try and teach on that. Okay? So deism is based on reason. So we're going to start out with a few things that defy reason. Okay? Oh, I've got to point it this way. And now a few things that deny reason. That's a really nice hammer, isn't it? <laughs> this is an actual building in Sweden. I do not want to work on the top floor. I heard somebody say that. <laughs> That's just sad. Why? Why? It looks like somebody came down with a big karate chop. Yeah. <laughs> you ever seen this before? Which stack is going up? Which one is on the ground? And which one is, well, you can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that is reality. It's actually there. Defies reason. How about that one? The alligator actually has his eyes closed and is enjoying the butterflies on top of his head. I would not go anywhere near that alligator. How about this one? <laughs> Obviously that's been photoshopped. If olive oil is made of olives, then baby oil is. <laughs> This is an actual photo. This is not a Photoshop. This is a young giraffe scared for his life on his mother's neck. <laughs> that defies reason. My neck would be very tired. <laughs> it's a little scary. So this morning we're going to talk about a few things that deny reason. They don't make sense to, the, to our mind. But our mind is subject to this realm, so we need to kind of step into another realm to get it. Because if I take this thermos out and I throw it to you, what do you have to do? <laughs> okay. What I'm going to teach you this morning, watch how it helped it. I'll stand up a second. I'm going to throw this to you. 
Okay, ready? <laughs> Welcome back, Lois. See what happens when you leave the sanctuary? Here we go. Okay. Here we go. What did Hal have to do to get that water bottle? Yeah. Was he ready? Did he know it's coming? Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm telling you it's coming. So get ready to catch it. Because what I want to tell, teach you this morning needs to be caught, not just taught. Because deism is reason. And teaching is reason. You're going to have to catch it. Okay. So as we go, Ed's going to punctuate things with a worship song here and there. So we're going to sing Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, as we start. So. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see relationship with God, best place to start is where? Beginning. Beginning. Yeah. So let, let's look at Genesis 3, 8. The Bible says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid the Lord God, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay. So you see on the left side, if you can't see it from where you are, there's a key. And what I want to share with you today, I hope, will become a key in your life to open a deeper relationship with the Lord, to open deeper encounters with the Lord in your private life, to open your understanding and your perception in the Spirit. So when God came in the cool of the day, do you get the feeling that that was a habit? Yes. Did, that, did God walk in the garden? And this is before sin, so do you think there was an access to the spiritual realm for Adam and Eve? Now, they were Adam, male and female at that point. She didn't have a name. It was like, there's the lions, male and female. There's the tigers, male and female. There's Adam, male and female. So... When we, when we look at this, you look at the idea that God wanted to talk to them and he created this beautiful place. You ever sit in a garden? When I was a little kid in England, there were gardens. You'd visit places and they would have these tailored gardens and just this wonderful smell of whatever was in bloom. And I don't know about you, 
I love sitting on my deck with pots of color everywhere. I'm not a gardener, but I know how to put flowers and dirt in pots. <laughs> so what is God's heart for them? What does he want from Adam and Eve? That's the word. Say it out loud. Relationship. relationship. And relationship, I want to tell you now, is the only thing you can take with you. When you get to heaven, the Lord is not going to ask you what all you did for him. He's going to ask you how you treated people and how did the word flow through your life. How did his spirit, the fruit of his spirit, how much of it did you yield to? So let's jump forward to Sinai. So now we have a million people walking out of Egypt across the desert and they come to Mount Sinai and God comes down on Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, God comes and he speaks. He says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, which is better than a promise, by the way. Covenant means even if I fall asleep like Abraham, God is still going to keep covenant like he did with Abraham. Because sleeping men don't keep covenants. My husband said that. <clears throat> so now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me, now get this, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Where have we heard that before? 1 Peter 2, 8 and 9. For you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. So the same, the God of the Old Testament has the same plan in the New Testament because he's God, he changes not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so that's still the plan, but I want you to see that it was God's plan at the beginning. Okay, so these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. So he goes up on the mountain. First time he climbs the mountain, by the way, he was 80 years old. First time he climbed Sinai, Moses was 80. You ever watch Bill Puckett work outside in the parking lot? I peeked out one day this past week and he's putting painter's tape down on the parking lot to make those stripes look like they do. You're never too old for God to use you. He's not done with you, Phil. Did you know that? And he's not 80. And he's not 80, no. <laughs> but I love picking on him. I love picking on the pocket. There you go. Okay. So they come, they come back, and, and Moses comes down the mountain, and he says to them, here, here you go, the next chapter. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. So who... Who rejected relationship now? Adam and Eve had done it in the garden, right? So now the Israelites are doing it, okay? So they get the law. In my office, when I counsel with children, I tell them that those are God's 10 rules to have a happy life. Because scientists have done studies on the 10 commandments and they have proven that people who have lived by the, the Decalogue the Ten Commandments in their life actually are more psychologically healthy. So these guys are coming from a, a slave mindset. They've been told what to do, what to wear, when to get up, where to go, where to eat. Sounds like prison, doesn't it? And now they're free. And God says, okay, let me give you some boundaries so that you know how to live. And that's what Jesus does for us. So they've stepped over relationship. So God is still involved with them, right? <clears throat> Moses 
leads them through the wilderness. There's battles in the in the uh, in Canaan and judges. You've got um, Deborah and Gideon. You got Sam. Uh, Gideon and Deborah and Samson, you see his braid there. You know, but you've got every 40 years or so, the Lord would raise up a leader and the Lord would use them based on their gifting, mind you. He would utilize the gift he had placed in them to lead a people. And when they died, he would raise up someone else. And that, that was how things were running. And then Samuel came along and then Samuel died. But before Samuel died, here we go. Now Samuel did something that not many, many people do it, and it works in the world. We're watching President Trump do it with Ivanka. It ha it's called nepotism. Okay. Samuel thought it would work because his kids had been raised in church, their church. They had been raised around the Spirit of God. So as they got older, he began to say, okay, you do this job and you do that job. And I'll tell you this right now. When Bill and I put, passed the baton to Bethany for worship, we didn't do it because she was our daughter. We did it because there was a seal of the Spirit, and the Spirit said, do it. And that's why the anointing remains when that happens. But Samuel, so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you're old, and your sons do not follow your ways. So appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing this to you. So listen to them, but warn them solemnly, solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his right. So, they got Saul. Yippee. Yeah. <laughs> Saul was an abusive narcissist. In fact, when God removed the kingdom from him, he said, when you were little in your own eyes, I blessed you. Not now. So, they got so, here's a question. Was the idea of an individual ruling authority figure God's original design for his people? No. <coughs> what was? Relationship. Just let that sink in a minute. Because this is where the concept of authority figures came from. This, and the American church is hung up on power, supremacy, and authority. You see it in the faith movement. You see it in lots of churches. Who's the boss? Well, I want to be submissive. I want to be accountable. You can't make anybody be accountable. It's voluntary. Because accountability means an open heart. And nobody can open your heart but you. And God's kingdom does not run with fear. It runs on love. Getting a picture of deism yet? Okay. So now we're going to sing another song. Thank you. 
move forward. So Israel steps over relationship time and again, and then beginning with Solomon's sons, and I'll tell you, Pastor Todd on David a couple weeks ago, I wish I had it on tape. It's really, really good. Yes. Oh my. Did you know David had a sexual addiction? It was his habit to go watch a woman take a bath on the roof. That was his magazine. That was his internet. And then he murdered somebody to get her. Did you know that Bathsheba was Solomon's mother? Solomon had 800 wives. Yeah. I call that a sexual addiction too, wouldn't you? <laughs> And then Rehoboam and Jeroboam were his sons, and they split the kingdom. Well, don't even go there. So what God told them would happen if they had a king to represent his authority happened. So now that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come down and do his thing because they won't pay their taxes, God talks to a prophet named Isaiah. Well, this is during Ahab's time, actually, but we know Nebuchadnezzar's coming soon, don't we? Okay. So Isaiah, the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. You ever ask God why? You think he wants you to know why? This verse tells me that God wants me to know why. Lord, why do I do this? 
I think he wants you to know. Let's reason together. One time when Bethany was little, um, hi Bethany. When she was little, she was about six or seven and she had gotten in deep trouble for doing something that she wasn't supposed to do. And we had done the, are you choosing to disobey? Okay, if you are. And I think she just tested it to see if, if I would follow through. You ever feel like that with your kids? So she got her spanking and then we sat down and talked about it. And she says, Mom, why do I disobey? I told her about Adam and Eve and she's, she's sat there and thought for a minute. She says, I said, what, honey? She says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to slap Adam. <laughs> so Israel wanted her. The Lord explains why the people's prayers and fastings have not been answered. Okay? So I'll just read it to you. He says, Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. I'm going to fast and God's going to give me power over the people I don't like. Basically, that's what they were doing. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed for repentance? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the, to the Lord? But is this not the fast which I have chosen? to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here, I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And get this, and you will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. He takes them back where? The garden. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, Jesus, the first place Jesus shed blood after the, after the stripes on his back, well, before the stripes on his back, was a garden. And he was he praying for a healed will because man's will was bruised and eaten. He shed blood first there. Gotta find my spot here. Hold on. And this is the result of relationship. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. So Abba Father continually refers to a garden, reminding them of where it all began. He's seeking to provide a picture of relationship, and what do they do? They step over it. They see it as a speed bump. Why do you think they do that? Somebody holler out an idea. Why do you think they do that? There's no right or wrong answer. I just want to discuss this with you. Why do they do that? Fear. Sin nature. That's good. Fear. What are they afraid of, Lois? The unknown. The, the, there's so many things. Vulnerable, you know, being vulnerable. Being vulnerable. Same things we do, you know, when we step over relationships or we, you know. And our flesh makes us do that. Yeah, right. 
Our flesh makes us do that. And the world sa- the Bible says that the, our flesh is at enmity with God, that it is in league with the world. So the, I, the need for image, the need for recognition, the need to be on top, the need to be successful, the need to be seen a certain way, mm, that's my flesh, which buys into deism. Right? It's all IQ. So what did Jesus do? What did what did God do? The garden has now become full of weeds because the soul now of man is considered the garden based on Isaiah 58. So now what happens? Just read it with me. He emptied himself and came into our world again, just like he had in Eden. And if you want to do a study on it, John 1, 17 and 18 says, the only begotten of God, he has explained him. Says, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of God, he's explained him, right? Who's the only begotten of God? God. So who appeared to Samuel? Jesus. Who walked with Adam and Eve? Jesus. Who walked with Enoch? Who was the angel of the Lord that showed up to Joshua? Jesus. It's a pre-incarnate Christ, slain from before the foundation of the earth, and he's God. He's creator. He can do whatever he needs to do. And so he steps into our world one more time. So when we, when we worship, he comes and shows us how to live. I, I wrote it one too soon. You ever wonder why Jesus was born into a family and didn't just show up as a Lone Ranger, Superman, come to save the world? Because family was his idea. Family was God's idea. And then he paid a price. But you know, his eyes weren't even on the price. Where were they? Where were they? John says, when the time drew near for his ascension to the Father, he set his faith like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He wasn't even thinking about the cross. He's thinking about getting home. Yeah, we have to go through that bad part of town, Dad, but I'm coming home. And then he rose again. Which makes what Hebrew says is the speaking blood of Jesus says greater things than of righteous men that have died and names evil. We're going to sing another song. This is my desire. 
that says that no man ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it. You ever get to that point where it's just like, I don't care, I'm going to take a shower. I don't care, I'm going to sit down and eat popcorn and put my feet up. Jesus said, love others as you love yourself. This is a picture or a rendering of Matthew. By 45 to 50 AD, Matthew was the first gospel written down, and it had been circulated throughout most of the known world. By 350 AD, there were over 500 translations of Matthew's story of Jesus in the known world. 500 translations. Problem was, that there were little sects developing, like the Marcionite churches around the Black Sea. Marcion's dad was a, a fisherman, and Marcion decided he didn't like some of the New Testament after it had been canonized. He decided, I think I'll throw most of Paul's writings out. So he didn't like Paul. And he decided he liked only a couple of the Gospels. And he was part Gnosticism, which is very high reasoning. They didn't believe Jesus really had a body his whole life. They thought, well, he just showed up in a spiritual form that looked like a body. Well, it was 300 years after Jesus' resurrection. They had no idea what had really happened. Without, If you throw it out, you don't get the information, right? So there was a church council that met and they decided, of leaders, and they decided that they were going to confiscate every copy of every scripture in the known world. Okay? So they did. And they said, we're going to take the original manuscripts, the ones that are the most reliable, and we're going to park a guy named Jerome. This is Jerome. I don't know that that's really Jerome, because it was painted in the Dark Ages. But everything that pertains to Jerome's life is in the picture. When we were in Bethlehem in the Church of the Nativity, there is a grotto that was dug out of the rock that was J Jerome's grotto. And he lived in that little built that little room for years and he took every known manuscript and translated it all into latin and that is called the vulgate now here was the problem 
we, it was an, an age of serfs and, and little kings. Everybody who had a castle had an army. So there were a lot of little kingdoms all the way everywhere. Okay? Nations were beginning to form at that point. But the Catholic Church said, hey, we think the Pope is God on earth. So he must be the chief authority over all of the kings. And so the only people who can read the Bible now will be the people who are educated to do so and know what it means. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because you don't want people getting false doctrine. The problem was that it ushered in the Dark Ages. And we call them the Dark Ages because there was no enlightenment. The Renaissance is called the Age of Enlightenment, and guess what? It was the precursor to the Reformation, because the word was going to come forth again. So here's the deal. During the Dark Ages, this was the image of God portrayed. God is an angry God who hates sin, he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. I hate that statement. God can have nothing to do with sin. Then why did Jesus heal unsaved people? While we were yet sinners, what did he do? He died for us. That's pretty cool. He didn't even know me and he died for me, Lois. He took a bullet for me. Yeah. I would too, Daddy. I mean, a Gatling gun. <laughs> and the priests began to wield the power. This is where the idea that the church has money comes from. Because they would bleed people. And then there was this thing that developed in the 1100s, the Pope, they, they started the Crusades, and the Pope wanted to raise money for the army, so they started selling indulgences. And they started saying, you can buy your relatives way into heaven if you buy ten candles. You can get them out of purgatory. Where is purgatory? I don't think purgatory, well, never mind. Pope Bonatrace, or Boniface, I don't have my glasses on, the eighth, he said, God has set popes over kings and kingdoms. And by the way, this pope was not a born again man. This is the guy who hired prostitutes to entertain the priests in Rome. This is the guy who said, this myth of the gospel will make us all rich. So that's where the church leadership was during the Dark Ages. You getting it? So, so saying, the concept of God being far away was taught and reinforced. This is deism. So let me ask you a question. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you're alone on your journey? Did you know that you are a pioneer? You are a pioneer. You have never been where you're going. And everywhere you go, you are the first one to get there in your life. And God sees that. He knows that, and he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You ever feel like that? It's awesome. It makes you feel really small and unimportant, except that God says, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. I cannot forget you. How about that? Where's God? 
God, where are you in this? You ever feel that way? Okay. Deism is intellect-based and it is performance-oriented. It got mixed in with Christianity through the teachings of John Calvin. John Calvin was all about God is watching from a distance. Some, some theologians said God is playing chess. Now, this is where it bleeds into the church today. You ever hear somebody say this? God is done. All he's going to do, the rest is up to you. I had a lady come in. She was paraplegic after a car accident. Through a series of miracles, she walks with a crutch. She's now climbing. You know what her church told her? We don't understand why you're not healed. We don't understand why you still walk like you're handicapped. You must be working on your faith. Since when, if God gives to every man a measure of faith, since when is my faith my responsibility? Think about that. Think about it. Anything that puts the pressure on you to make something happen that comes from God is false doctrine. Deism is false doctrine. I know it's a hot topic. We're doing hot topics this month. Deism does this to us. And the thing is, it can slap a scripture on it and make it sound right. Don't get me started on that. It also does this to the church. See, deism operates on the principles of the world. God is all powerful, who gives a little authority to the less powerful, who then rule over the, those who have no power at all. How is that possible when God says, the Lord your God in the midst of you is mighty, and he says, you are my friends. You are seated with me in heavenly places. Wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. You see how it becomes false doctrine? Because distance creates rejection. Distance creates a lack of communication. Distance creates silence. And what we do in result of that, something in our brain says, God doesn't really care. Okay, so the concept of God that the people had in the Dark Ages, God is waiting and watching in order to punish us for what we've done wrong. Don't mess up, God's watching. God saw you do that. Do you know shame came after sin? Shame showed up in the garden after sin. Shame is not God's idea. Shame is not conviction. I don't care what the holiness teachers teach you, shame and guilt are not God's way of convicting you. He is the angry father being held back by the protective son. Have you ever do the four spiritual laws? We used to knock on the door. I had four doors door slammed in my face. Excuse me, ma'am, can I tell you about the four spiritual laws? Well, yes. Did you know that man is sinful and is separated? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's number one. The lady would go, that's awesome. Number two, man is sinful and is separated from God. Law number three, Jesus Christ became the bridge so that we could get to God because we can't get to God because we're all bad. And law number four, now you have new life. I can mentally understand that. Did my heart get that? 
I thought it was the kindness of God that led me to repentance. That's Romans. So this went on for about a thousand years. And then, beginning on October 31st, 1517, there's a guy in England who starts translating the New Testament. His name is William Tyndale. And there's a little angry German man who's a priest. You know what his penance was for nailing those theses on the wall? They made him take an itty bitty brush and scrub the stairs to the cathedral. I'd be madder still. So Martin Luther shares the just shall live by faith, not by indulgences, not by hierarchy, not by all the rules, not by lighting candles, not by letting somebody else represent God to me because there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What he had to share spread to Switzerland. Wonderful theologians came out of Switzerland. John Huss, John Calvin. What are some other ones, honey? Zwingli. Zwingli came out of there. But, you know, when you're in the mountains, <laughs> it's a good place to think. Can I chase a bunny for half a second? No. Do you know what happened to, sorry. Do you know what happened to Pilate? Pilate ended up giving his heart to Jesus. And before he died, he was stationed in the most remote place they could find him. He was stationed in Switzerland. And there are two mountains named Pilatus in Switzerland, around the area where he was put, because he would go to the mountain to pray. Anyway, so I chased a bunny, so sorry. Awesome. It is awesome. So from Switzerland, it went to France. And in France, there was a little girl who had been abandoned by her parents, and they were very um, ambitious people. And she became a lady-in-waiting for the Queen of France. And so by the time she was marriage of marriageable age, she was very beautiful, very well spoken, and there was the revival had hit the French court, which is what eventually what happened when the Huguenots showed up, and then we had the French Revolution. Everything goes back to the word. So we've got we've got France, and her name is Anne Boleyn, and she is sent from France as a gesture to the court of Henry VIII. Now Henry had trained to become the Archbishop of Canterbury. His lifelong dream was to be in the ministry. But his brother was king and his brother died. So the, the guys in charge, now remember the only church in, in existence at that time is a Catholic church. And the Pope tells everybody what to do even the government. And he says, well, to be king, Henry must marry his brother's widow. Well, Henry didn't want to marry his brother's widow. Henry wasn't sure he wanted to get married in the first place. He wanted to be a priest. And this little girl, who's now 18 or 19 years old, is in his court, and she is a sanguine she likes to dance, she likes to have fun, she brightens up her room when she walks in. They began to talk theology, and she shared her books with him. She shared Martin Luther's writings with him. She shared the stuff from Switzerland with him, and Henry gave his heart to Jesus. See, we don't hear this side of the history. That was the beginning of the English Reformation. The Church of England, because eventually Henry said, I've had enough of this crap, I'll be the head of the church. I'm not God on earth, but God has made me king. And I'm at least going to be in charge of the church in my own country. You're not going to tell me what I can and can't do, because you told me to do something that wasn't scriptural in the first place. Go away. Just go away. 
He was a little more forceful than that. He said, I'll with his head, but you know. <laughs> the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, or in our country we call it the Episcopal Church, is responsible for the first legally distributed English Bible. Good Queen Kate, who was Henry VIII's sixth wife, he was in France at the time, and she was queen regent. And she took advantage of it, and she told Oliver Cromwell, let's publish it while Henry's out of the country. And it was published in the common tongue of the day. It is the Bible that John Bunyan preached from. It's called the Plowman's Bible. Does that make any sense? Are you still with me? Am I going too fast? All right. So... In this season, that's when Pilgrim's Progress was written. If you can find an unabridged version, it's in the Old English, but it's fascinating read and a lot of revelation in it. But man began to understand God is love. God is love. He's reaching to us. We're not trying to get to him. He's as close as a breath. Take a breath. Let it out. Take another one. God breathed into Adam and Adam became what? A living soul. So this is a funny, I think it's funny. What do you call a guy walking around who doesn't believe God exists and is breathing? Grace. You call that grace. Because without God, he wouldn't be breathing. So, let's see where we are. So this is the concept of God that began to emerge. We are invited to the garden for that. That's what we feel when we worship. This is theism. The belief that God has intimate knowledge of his creation. Do you believe that? Yes. That he is involved deeply and lovingly in the affairs of everything he has made. Do you believe that? So here are pictures of trust. What's that relationship like? What's that relationship like? What do you think? I love her little mop top. What's that relationship like? We are now having a pandemic issue of young men in our culture who have grown up without fathers many of whom are gay. If you've never read the book Fathered by God by John Eldridge, it will change your life. It will change your understanding of, of what manhood really is. See, deism is on the left. God is removed from his universe. Theism is on the right. All things exist in him through him, and by him. You ever hear Bette Midler's song? God is watching us. God is watching us. Anybody know that one? God is watching us from a distance. I love this little clip. This little guy says, in the left he says, it seems like God is too far away from me. And then it pans out and it says, I can't see anything. He's too far away. <laughs> so rather than this, and you know, Deus will use Jacob's ladder as a way to defend their mindset. But you can see how it seeped into the church. Can you see it? You ever have a pastor look at you and go, touch not, God's anointed. Don't argue with me. Heaven help him. 
because Saul didn't say that to David. God said that to David, and God said that to David about Saul because he didn't want his hands dirty because it would mess up worship. He didn't get to build the temple because he killed Uriah. He did get dirty. He did get his hands dirty. God's way of doing things is more like this. He drops something, and it's a truth. And those who are in relationship with the Lord, and I'll tell you this about the worship renewal that started in the 80s. It came to those that were cultivating the garden of their soul and relating to the Lord in worship every day. And we see the effects of it as the ripples have gone out. So now, even the Presbyterian Church has what they call contemporary worship. When Bill and I started in ministry, there was a piano and an organ, never drums on the platform, never guitars, never bass, bass guitar. It was piano and organ in the choir. And it wasn't that the other stuff was wrong, it just wasn't that moment. I remember having a dream when we lived in Tulsa. I woke up one morning and I, I had seen a choir on risers behind a line of two or three singers and I saw band instruments. And I, our little church in Indiana, I, I woke up and I told Bill, I said, honey, I think something needs to change in how we do our worship. I'm not sure what it's gonna look like because I've never seen that because we were still paying 20 bucks per transparency to put a song on the wall before CCLI. I love Sherry Iverson. She's a wonderful person. They called it Star Praise when it began. We went down to see my folks in Tulsa. And a friend of mine was leading worship at a large church there. And so we went there and um, walked in. And uh, I just stood there. You know what they had? They had a choir on risers. Four singers, a worship leader, and band instruments, and they hadn't been doing it that long. And it just occurred to the leader one day, you know, we need to do this. I think the Holy Spirit gave me this concept. I went, yeah, he gave me that concept too, and I didn't move on it yet. I'm going home, I'm gonna move on it. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> when it's time, he dropped something. Martin Luther, we know Martin Luther because he got in trouble. But Tyndale was already translating in England. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I just, I thought that was so cool. So, that being said, if you replace hierarchy with concentric circles where we are all pressing to the core to know God, we understand the Trinity. And that circle is a picture of the Trinity. Joseph of Arimathea is credited with creating this symbol, by the way. He was a missionary to the Celts in 38 AD. Um, but that fellowship is the picture. Which one of those fish is more important? The one pointed up? Are the two on the bottom less important? They're all equal, aren't they? So when we're invited into the circle of fellowship, there's something that happens God's no respecter of persons, so if he says it to Jeremiah, it applies to you too. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. God knew you before you were born. So his plan must be good, huh? This is not if I put my mind to it, I can accomplish anything. 
I think I'll make a plan that looks good in the world's eyes, and then you'll bless it. Right, Lord? Hmm, that's deism. So we're going to sing another song. circle between the two trinity signs. God said, I speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. For if no man seen God at any time, that must have been Jesus. Jesus talked to Moses. You ever wonder why the Mount of Transfiguration was Moses and Elijah? That's why. This kid's running. In this picture. And the Holy Spirit stops him. Jesus gets his attention. And Abba loves him. It's what God wants to do for us. Inside every one of us there is a child. Waiting for approval. Waiting for bonding waiting to be given a, a model of what to do next. Because as, as loving or as kind as our parents tried to be, 
We were created to be imprinted with our creator when we opened our eyes. And now we have counterfeits. There's only one perfect parent. Don't get mad at your folks. They didn't know either. So today I'm going to give you a choice. Deism or theism. You cannot, and, and so many people have tried to bridge the gap, and it's trying to have one foot in the boat and one foot on the dock and have the boat pull away from the water. You'll be lost in the woods your whole life if you try to do both. Being vulnerable with God, stepping into the dance of heaven, Augustine called it perichoresis. Right, honey? Bill did that in, he has that in his thesis for his doctorate. It's a great, if you can read all of it, 418 pages, if you can read all of it, it's really good. When um, Bill's brother got married, we went to the wedding in New Jersey, and uh, Rachel was four or five. And the father-daughter dance came up. And she said, Daddy, I want to dance too. And he's thinking, OK. But they got out on the dance floor, and she just kind of stood there. You know, I'm here, I want to do it. And Bill did a wonderful thing. He reached down and he took her hands. And he said, honey, put your feet on top of mine. And they did. When God invites us into the dance of heaven, you don't have to know the steps. <laughs> you just got to turn when he does. Can I borrow you, honey? He says this all the time. He says, return to me. Turn to me. One of the most healing things in our marriage was when we decided to turn toward each other. So, can, you, can we illustrate the idea of turning with God? Yeah. Okay, so you're leading. He doesn't know we're gonna do this, by the way. Yes. I'm surprised with all of you. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna follow your turn. This is our life in the spirit. So I am face to face with God. You turn the other way, I'm getting dizzy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling God what No, no, I'm just saying, I don't know if I can do this, Lord. <laughs> I'm sitting down there. Would you help me again? I want you to watch, though, because our life with God is like this. James says, everyone who sins, he sins when he's pulled away or drawn away by his own lust and enticed. So we see something we want and we get teased. The word enticed means to break the embrace. It means not to be facing, not to be looking, not to be turning, not to be with, not to be in the dance. God wants that with you. God wants that with you. God wants that with you. Last point. Scripture, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I think it's 419. 
I get the addresses mixed up. I turn them around, you know, I'm not, I wish I could say I was six this year instead of 60. Um, you know, zero six and six zero. We got it. You got it. <laughs> all right. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, it says in the King James. The Greek word there is a picture of a steak. The picture I could think of would be a steak tied to a tomato plant that makes it strong and helps it grow so it won't break. But the Greek word is stronger than that. It's this. Jesus wants to be that with you. He wants to dance with you. He sings over you. He planned you. He planned your gender. He planned the color of your eyes. And he loves you. And that's all I've got. It's wonderful. Thanks, Sam. Oh, uh, you got through 2,000 years of church history in uh, Sunday morning. Uh, by the way, we'll be giving out bachelor degrees after the service. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't give us a test. <laughs>